Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to Bite Marks. Uh, it's been a while since our last episode, but uh, we're here with a very special guest. Uh, say hello to Discourse from Discourse Miniatures. Hey, hi there. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, uh, so you, why don't you tell the audience about uh, your channel? Um, because we are about to engage in some discourse. <laughs> You have no idea how much truck I get out of that joke. I, I get to make it every single post on Reddit. Um, so yeah, my uh, channel is a channel focused on discussing topical issues in the miniature wargaming community. And specifically, I, I like to advocate on behalf of hobbyists. I would say that I take a critical perspective on a lot of business practices in the hobby, mm -hmm. but I do try to balance that out with very silly sketches. So <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've been a fan of your channel for a while now. Um, uh, it's uh, it, I do appreciate all the work that you do uh, in terms of putting a skit together, but also actually being a pro-consumer uh, advocate. I think oftentimes in hobby spaces, it's very easy for everyone to go into the kind of, I hate to say it, but the sort of the soy jack uh, consume, you know, where we, we just get caught up with the latest thing and uh, we don't really pay attention to what the companies are doing to us. Well, yeah, and I think in a lot of ways that's by design, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of, it happens in lots of different spaces. It's very big in the miniature wargaming space, but it happens in lots of different spaces where people conflate their own sense of identity, I think, with the hobbies that they enjoy. And with miniature wargaming, it can be really very much a lifestyle hobby. Yeah. It takes up a lot of time and has so many components from painting to actually playing the games and wargaming that it can really consume one's life. Yeah, and exactly. so, you know, you're, you're gonna get really defensive if someone is sort of, as you perceive, attacking the fundamental aspects of that ho hobby. So I'm, I'm always very careful to try and, you know, position myself as an advocate on behalf of hobbyists mm -hmm. against business practices, as opposed to just someone who is complaining about problems in the hobby and that's it, right? I always try to offer solutions of some kind. Yeah, of course. Um... I love the hobby too. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very critical of war games, but that's because I'm a long time war gamer. I love this hobby. <laughs> I don't like the painting <laughs> uh, so much. Yeah. Um, we, we are agreed. We're agreed there then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well. It, uh, painting is not my favorite thing, but I love playing. I love talking to someone. Yeah. I like being across the table from them. You know, I, I play video games as well, but there's, if you gave me a choice between playing a war game with someone or playing a video game with someone. I would always basically pick playing the war game because yeah it, it's a social it's a social experience yeah. i i completely agree with you there and i think that the last of, the last two years have made that a very stark uh, aspect oh, of yeah. the hobby because i played a lot of games on tabletop simulator which you know is a great space for playing a lot of these games digitally but mm -hmm. it's just not the same it doesn't have yeah. the same sort of experience it's not as tactile and that's really the big massive advantage that miniatures have over video games because i'm the same i play a lot of video games or i did before the, i started the channel but i just i i don't really have space in it anymore because i do much prefer the social experience of miniature war games yeah i think uh for me especially i've noticed playing on tabletop simulator i don't get as many stories from my yeah. Uh, game gameplay sessions because when I'm playing with someone I'm talking to them you know I'm talking hey I'm you know I, I I'm trying to do this I'm trying to do that I'm hoping that this is going to happen and we can commiserate together in a very tactile <laughs> very sort of uh, immediate sense where if I roll a bunch of sixes and I and one of my units wipes out their unit I can see you know I can feel their despair but similarly they can <laughs> do that when when that happens to me <laughs> and with my luck that happens more often than you think um, <laughs> So yep, it's, it's yeah, it's good. So we, we we this is why I think your channel does actually have a lot to to to, to work with, you know, in terms of bite marks because bite marks is a uh, a leftist uh, gaming podcast. We are trying to be critical of gaming because we like gaming, uh, and war games are you know a part of games. So obviously, uh, if we're having you on, uh, then that must mean that we have to be talking about the uh, ele giant elephant in the room, uh, which is of course Games Workshop. Uh, so, uh, for the viewers uh, who uh, maybe don't know, uh, why don't you uh, give us a brief synopsis of uh, Games Workshop? Oh, wow. Okay, so, I mean, Games Workshop are definitely, I suppose, the royal family of the miniature war game hobby, I would say. Mm -hmm. They very much occupy a very privileged position. Now, they started quite small back in the 80s, or, well, late 70s, but... 
they have managed to sort of leverage a specific IP that they have, the Warhammer 40k IP, mm -hmm. and they've turned that into a major component of the miniature wargaming hobby. It pretty much dominates any discussion that you have to have about the hobby, because as much as there are plenty of little companies all over the place who are producing great games, great miniatures, if you say the miniature wargaming hobby, the vast majority of people that you speak to will think the Warhammer hobby yes. that is run by Games Workshop. So that's Games Workshop's position. If you imagine it, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of people who have played video games who are probably more familiar with that marketplace. Mm -hmm. But if you imagine if everybody spoke about Ubisoft and just Ubisoft yeah. when you were speaking about video games, you know, and everything was in relation to Ubisoft. Yeah, if you're... Or, um... Oh, sorry, I was just going to say that if you're talking about the uh, open world game, you are basically talking about an Ubisoft game because they kind yeah. of have the the monopoly on those kinds of open world pseudo RPG kind of games, you know, third person. Yeah, 100%. It would be the same like the tabletop role playing marketplace where everyone talks about D&D. &D. It's hard to sort of get any space for alternative games like White Wolf games or anything. Mm -hmm. So that is that is where Games Workshop occupies at the minute and they have a whole roster of different games various systems and they have right now they have two main settings one is the warhammer 40k setting which is sort of their main setting it's a sci-fi universe set in the far future and they have popularized the term grimdark which is everything is awful all the time yep um and that even extends to how they run the game and then <laughs> yeah definitely. Also Age of Sigmar as well, which is a newer property. It replaced their old Warhammer Fantasy setting. Uh, that's more of a sort of, that, that's a newer, fresher take, very heroic fantasy style. Yeah, uh, the, you know, Games Workshop kind of behaves a lot like the Imperium, uh, which is really yeah. funny because uh, the Imperium are the bad guys of the set. <laughs> you know, I, I, I well, once, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it, that's that gets really to the heart of 40k i think are you know are the imperium the bad guys because i think so many people don't perceive them to be so they're very much situated in the narrative of the game as the protagonist faction i think these days yeah we uh, we have a couple of videos on the channel where i actually go into like yeah the imperium are the bad guys uh but the problem is that the writers of the setting made it so that the imperium are the bad guys but everyone else is also worse and so they're good because they are the pr perspective character because we're human and we're more likely to identify with humans than we are with you know uh, soulless uh, automata necrons or uh, ravenous uh, flesh beast turnids but that does mean that it carries a lot of issues with what kind of character the imperium actually is um i it's interesting that you mentioned age of sigmar because age of sigmar is very interesting because i think it's one of the most creative uh, certainly products they've produced in a long time. It's very different. Um, and that, that that is, of course, coming from a fan of the fantasy setting. But I like Age of Sigmar. I think it's interesting. Uh, it has more factions that are actually much more than just uh, repurposed uh, Tolkien, you know, stereotypes. Um, but uh, we might actually get into that. So the, from the way that I see it, there are three sort of main thrusts of, like, the long-term outlook for Games Workshop. Um, they are... Uh, the uh, the effects of 3D printing, uh, Games Workshop's shift to a media company, and uh, the monopoly of Games Workshop in the war game space. Uh, I of course leave it to you as to which order we tackle these in. Well, I suppose uh, we we have to talk about the position of Games Workshop in the miniature war gaming hobby mm -hmm. before we can really get into yeah. how that will be impacted. I, I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> so. And that, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no. So from your perspective, uh, Games Workshop, I, well, also from my perspective, I think Games, Games Workshop is very interesting because, as you mentioned earlier, uh, there aren't really other competitors to it. You know, there are other historical war games companies like Warlord Games, Perry Miniatures, you know, a couple others. And there are kind of other sci-fi war games, you know, systems, uh, Battletech and so on. But Games Workshop is kind of unique in the sense that it's its own kind of thing. We don't think of it really as a sci-fi game or really as a fantasy game. We think of it as a games workshop game. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I suppose games workshop occupy a very contradictory position mm -hmm. in the marketplace. So for a lot of people, they are very much the first exposure that anyone gets to miniature wargaming. And it's through the IP that they actually get into miniatures, right? So they're exposed to Warhammer in some to some extent in a video game, or it used to be, 
you know, many, many, many moons ago, it used to be on the high street, you'd walk past a, a Warhammer store, Games Workshop store at the time, and you would see the miniatures and you'd be interested in it for that reason. Mm -hmm. So it's very contradictory in the sense that they very much act like a beacon for new hobbyists. New hobbyists jump in into Warhammer and they are very much introduced to the Warhammer ecosystem. So everything in terms of the marketing material through to the codices, through to the the actual things that Games Workshop sell, basically sells the miniature hobby as the Warhammer hobby. And you'll find that throughout all of their materials, they always refer to it as the Warhammer hobby. Yeah. To the extent where I think the vast majority of people presume that Warhammer is the only game in town. And that speaks to the, the fact that there's they don't really have any competitors because they sort of obfuscate the fact that there are any competitors at all mm -hmm. but they have been able to sort of leverage their ip in order to act like a funnel that pulls in and draws in more hobbyists on the other hand though the reason why i say they're contradictory is because they essentially exploit these new hobbyists to the maximum optimal extent possible to optimize the profit that they're able to generate from those hobbyists in my opinion so i feel like they actually take those hobbyists and they produce as much miniatures as they can possibly get and use marketing techniques to trick them into spending the maximum amount of money, which often burns out a lot of those hobbyists who then just leave the miniature wargaming hobby entirely, having never experienced any other companies at all. Yeah, I, uh, I want to contrast that because my first experience as a wargamer was actually with the Games Workshop uh, IP. It was with uh, Warhammer Fantasy. Yeah. Uh, that was what everyone at the Wargames Club that I was at played. Which is kind of funny because uh, 40k is the actual one that has survived and fantasy is not, but it's a story for another day. Uh, but as I got more into war games, uh, I was then made aware that there are other kinds of war games. In particular, I, I want to contrast the way the Games Workshop does it to, say, for example, a lot of historical war games companies. Now, Warlord Games is not nearly the same in terms of scope and size as Games Workshop is. However, they do have quite a significant you know, market share in terms of the f historical war game settings. They've got Black Powder, they've got Bolt Action, you know, they've got a couple of other historical uh, settings. But the difference is that they actively encourage people to buy and consume miniatures from other places. Now, they're not going to necessarily um, you know, uh, not say, hey, don't buy our stuff, but they are going to say, hey, you know, if you want to buy miniatures for the American Civil War, you can buy our miniatures or you can buy, you know, Perry Miniatures, which are another uh, big company. And what they end up doing, the effect of it is that even though they don't necessarily cap out their own sort of market share, they get people more invested in the wider historical wargaming community. Because as players start cross-pollinating amongst different, you know, miniature companies and maybe even rule sets, right, uh, maybe even rule sets, they engage more in the community as a whole, even if it is not necessarily to the maximum benefit of Warlord Games. Games Workshop, on the other hand, as you said, the ecosystem, they don't want people out in the other ecosystem. They don't want people to be playing other kinds of games. What they only want is for you to consume a Games Workshop game, and that's it. And uh, ultimately, it's very destructive, because it means that you tie a player to the hobby, to the point where it's like they can't play other games, even though... Or they don't want to play other games because they've also maybe sunk a lot of time into playing Games Workshop games. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, the fact is, is that the miniature wargaming hobby, it costs a lot of money, you know, or at least it can do. And it also costs a lot of time, as you say. And so if I have only invested my time and money and effort into a Warhammer army of some kind, you know, if I, I've collected nothing but Space Marines, then that means I'm going to have a harder time exporting those factions into another games company line. So if I'm collecting bolt action, I'm collecting, say, a German army, I can still use that German army in a different game system, like through Fire and Flames. Mm -hmm. That's great, because I, I can I can, pro can cross-pollinate, as you say, and I can try all these, diff all these different systems. With Warhammer, that's not the case. They make bespoke models for their specific settings. And in fact, the vast majority of what I will say 3D prints, we'll maybe touch on this later, but a lot of the different sort of smaller independent vendors who sell counts as style of models will be selling models that are designed to step into the shoes of Warhammer models of some kind. Yes. So even there's a greater ecosystem around Games Workshop products that still maintains the hobby of Warhammer as opposed to miniatures. Yeah, that's true. And that, oh no, please continue. 
Well, I was going to say that that's changing now to some extent because you've got the rise of uh, miniature agnostic settings that are basically, they have been written in a way that they account for the fact that most people have Warhammer miniatures. So One Page Rules is a great example. Oh yeah. All yeah. of the, the factions for that game, it's essentially it's just two pages of rules and it works off the Patreon model. Um, so it's free completely, but you can support them on Patreon. And how they work is they basically have all the factions of their game are essentially exported versions of the Warhammer 40k setting. Yeah. So you've got the Dark Elves as opposed to Dark Eldar. Or yeah, they, the, uh, uh, they skirt the line uh, yeah. of uh, IP very, very carefully. Oh, very carefully. But I mean, it's what you have to do, I think, to some extent, because it's just an acknowledgement of the market reality is that the vast majority of people have some investment in warhammer mm -hmm. whether or not they like or detest the games and i think there's a lot of people in the latter half now as time has gone on but <laughs> that's a that's a different topic yeah i i i find it interesting because i have done historical war games and uh i don't you know i, I do like fantasy and science fiction war games uh, i like having you know weird and crazy wonderful models However, I will say that if I was a historical war gamer, I'm spoiled for choice. I can basically get a wide variety of miniatures that can often meet my needs at a very reasonable price point. Um, because uh, every uh, miniature producer knows that if they can't really get uh, you on their miniatures, you will be playing the, a different game, but with different miniatures. You know, if I can't get people to buy my uh, American Civil War minis, for example. There are other American Civil War minis that people will go and look at. And Games Workshop, on the other hand, want you so invested in Warhammer that it almost becomes impossible for uh, the idea of a, an alternative mini. However, there are um, you know some other kinds of issues, and that is, on the other hand, just purely gaming. Because I, I do like the one-page rule system. Uh, I do think that people should consider it. I actually, you know, before COVID and stuff, uh, I was using that system to teach kids at the high school that I volunteer at uh, sometimes <laughs> how to play war games. And I would not use Games Workshop rules because they're too complicated for a 12-year-old. Um, 100%. 100%. 100%. So, so I would use one-page rules. And the idea would be that, okay, you would play this game, but here's the thing. Even if I was using one-page rules, I was talking about it in terms of this is a space marine, this is an Eldar, this is a guardsman. Because the other side of this coin in the market monopoly is that Games Workshop has a very unique position because they have valuable IP, they have recognizable IP, whereas other war games companies don't really have that. And I think that has to, that is a big effect of why people still get into the ecosystem. Um, do you think that's oh, fair? Uh, I think that that is huge. That's a huge aspect of, of Games Workshop's success. And they acknowledge this themselves. So in all, all of the sort of internal documents that they have, all of their annual reports, they will openly acknowledge the fact that the Warhammer 40k specifically, um, but Warhammer generally IP is really the hallmark of their success, that it, it's the, really the only thing that they have that separates them from the rest. So in terms of historicals, you're right. They don't have an IP to work with, right? No one owns the, the rights to World War II. Yeah. So they'll have to compete on value for money. They'll have to compete on great miniature sculpts. They, you know, they have to compete in all these different arenas, but the IP, they, they, they can't just leverage that. The only other types of games that have what I would call strong IPs tend to be ones that have brought them in from somewhere else. So if we look at Star Wars Legion, for example, mm -hmm. the reason why when that first emerged, I thought that it could have been a very strong competitor to Games Workshop products was that it was utilizing the Star Wars IP. And that, that's a huge IP, right? right? That's going to draw in people who aren't invested in miniatures. Yeah, the, and, the, only, uh, the only shark bigger than Games Workshop is Disney. <laughs> right, exactly. And the thing about that is, is that Games Workshop acknowledged this, they know this, and it's why they've focused a lot more on video games in the, you know, in the last five, six, seven years. Ever since Dawn of War in the 2000s, I think, which was probably the big, the, the big major success that mm -hmm. sort of opened their eyes to it. And then Total War Warhammer, oh, which yeah. was just absolutely huge. There are three games that has, of that now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they're great. And <laughs> they really utilize the Warhammer Fantasy IP really strongly. And it pulls in a lot of people from what is what I would call a more accessible hobby, which is video games, yeah. into a hobby like miniature war gaming, which is probably quite a bit less accessible. It's Although, more niche. Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah, a lot more niche. Um, there's a lot more sort of a lot more that goes into starting it. And to their credit, Games Workshop, I think, 
do try to make it accessible to the extent that they want to pull people into their ecosystem rather than the wider ecosystem. But at least they do have things like stores that people can actually physically speak to someone else and get interested in the hobby. You know, they're able to buy everything they need in a Games Workshop store. Yeah. That aspect of things, I actually quite like. I uh, Well, look, uh, I, I, I want to be critical, but I don't want to just be overly negative. Uh, so I, I one quick tangent uh, before I respond to the point, and that I do think it's kind of suspicious that the Games Workshop have been talking about releasing Warhammer of the Old World, kind of in sort of tangent as the rise and rise and dominance of Total Warhammer has kind of been going on. I, I, I can't help but imagine that um, when Warhammer the Old World is ready to launch, a lot of the people who, who have played Total Warhammer will get into it in the same way that a lot of people who played Dawn of War will get into 40k. I think that's... I, I definitely think that's going to happen. Oh um, yeah, you're 100% you're you're 100 correct there. Um, that's no doubt in my mind that that is the case. I think that Old World only began getting you know, sort of talked about after the success of Total War Warhammer and Games Workshop realized that they'd sort of messed up a little bit by not having a, a clean introduction for this huge burst of new players, potential new players yeah. that came in from Total War Warhammer. Yeah, because fantasy, fantasy is much harder to get into 40k and I would argue that it's because video games make it easy to get into, you know, the vibe, the lore, uh, just some basic understanding of like how things relate to one another, you know, like how strong is the Space Marine supposed to be? Well, you can play the video game and you can kind of get an idea. Um, but I do also agree with you in the sense that Games Workshop do have a complete package, right? Uh, they have something that very few war game companies are actually able to provide, right? They have a full service ready to go in terms of deploying everything, you know, your dice, your rule books, uh, terrain, etc., etc., paints, yada, yada, yada. And many other companies don't have that capacity to do that. Like, there are some uh, miniatures companies that could never have the kind of customer service that Games Workshop has because they're like one guy in a shed, you know, who's uh, casting miniatures um, and who responds to emails. So it's like, yeah, the fact that Games Workshop do, do have these things, and these things are certainly nice because it makes it easier to get people into the hobby, uh, it also means that... Um, it makes it harder for people to escape from their orbit. So it's kind of like a, a double-edged sword in that way. Yeah, a hundred percent. And a funny thing I always find about that is the fact that, as you said earlier, the Games Workshop make it really easy for people to start playing the game, except for when it comes to the rules, in which case you're handed this massive tome <laughs> of very difficult to read text and three different codices. And you're told, right, get reading to that learn how your new 300 unit army works and come back here and we'll start playing some cards. And it's just, it's just <laughs> crazy to me that they, that they haven't introduced a more streamlined version of the game to some extent that would be much easier for sort of new players to get into. For, uh, for me, um, personally, this is my strategy. If I, w if I would want to get someone into, say, Warhammer Fantasy, I would actually start them off by playing more time. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of more time. Uh, yeah. It was the skirmish game for Warhammer Fantasy. And let me tell you, I would 100% get people to play more time and nothing but more time. <laughs> because <laughs> not only is it a fun game, right? I think the rules at that scale, at that sort of size, not only is it a fun game, I think it works much better uh, than some of the rules for Warhammer. But it's much easier to tell stories. It's much easier to get people into the world of Warhammer. And also it's much cheaper because you just need to buy a single box. Um, that, that kind of thing was, and of course, more time is, you know, not officially supported by Games Workshop anymore, because of course it isn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it is weird to me how Games Workshop know, they kind of know that their rules are really weird. It's, it's no doubt, certainly one of the issues of ninth edition, that the rules are kind of getting crazy. We're looking at DLC packs where they are selling a, a codex, then a codex supplement, then you get an errata. Then there's, you know, Warzone this or Warzone that. And then it's like more and more rules. And players are definitely experiencing, I, I guess, like a, a choice fatigue. You have too many things to remember. Um, you, you like have, how many stratagems do you have? Like, you know, it, it's so hard to remember. And I remember playing Games Workshop games when they were much simpler. And even then they were pretty complicated. Like the idea that you have to look up a table of strength versus toughness. And that gives you yeah. sort of, that is like, I'm not going to say that it's not okay that I, I do think there is a place for those kinds of complicated games because i play complicated games and you know, i play some naval games and those could be very complicated but for the kind of game that you're supposed to do a mass market appeal game that is supposed to get everyone into it 
that's still kind of complicated. If Games Workshop didn't have such fascinating IP, and you know, let's be real, a lot of it is kind of the borrowed product of other people's IP, <laughs> you know, Dune yeah. uh, and Tolkien and all of these other things that Games Workshop have uh, quote unquote uh, creatively taken from, although ap appropriation is maybe uh, a better word. But when you combine all these things together, the sum of it somehow becomes, you know, greater than the, its parts and you get people invested, you know, um, because I, I still know people who, even though they do grumble about Games Workshop, they still look at the new model release. They still look, hey, Magnus has a new model. I kind of want to look at it, even though they're complaining, you know, I feel like that power that they have is one of the reasons why them as a monopoly makes it so that they can get away with a lot of this terrible stuff, because if you do want grimdark fantasy, uh, or sci-fi. They're the only game in town, basically. Or at least they're the biggest beacon in the desert, you know? Uh, it's much oh, yeah. harder to get traction on other places and other ideas. And that is a problem, sure. It's definitely a problem. Uh, but it's it's a unique problem to Games Workshop because there aren't other war games companies that have this issue. <laughs> um, not not that I can think of, unless you, unless you have some examples. No, it, it is definitely a problem of Games of that Games Workshop have. And it's funny because, like you say, I mean, they are an entrance point to the hobby for lots of people. So you would expect the rules to be uh, much more uh, comprehensible or, you know, easier to understand. And I think that this is something that they missed They missed for a long time. You were talking about more time. I think if I were trying to get someone into 40K, I'd probably recommend Necromunda. Yeah. And for the longest time that, you know, they didn't have any skirmish games coming out, no real specialist games whatsoever. Now, this all changed in like 2017 or so, which coincided with their success story, I suppose, when they started to be a lot more responsive to the community. For a while there, there was a little, there was a little break in the clouds. <laughs> and I think that the, the, the rise of skirmish games was no, you know, was, was directly related to that. I think the skirmish games are actually super important to the hobby as a whole, yeah. not just Games Workshop, because like you say, they are cheaper to get, typically speaking. It's just like a single box of miniatures. They are better at telling stories, 100%. And that's always been one of the strengths of Necromunda, which is that it's so good at telling stories. And the same for Mordheim yeah. as well. Yeah, for me, I have like a million different Mordheim stories about a time where I failed a charge and then one of my heroes got you know pulled down by some rats. Or, you know, I was trying to... Mordheim had really, really good loot tables. I love those loot tables. Uh, it was so fun just rolling on them to see what would happen. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, the, the challenge for this particular thing is that we have Games Workshop... And also, I do agree, I think skirmish games are absolutely vital. Uh, but let me, let me take another tangent here and try to sell you on, like, really small-scale war games. I'm not sure if you have any experience with stuff at, like, six... A millimeter or less i don't i have a lot of people have been have have been talking their praises but i've never played it or really seen one in play myself so for me i the thing that i find mo very dissonant about warhammer is that you read black libraries you know books and it's like we're talking about millions of guardsmen like dying in a single battle and then you go to yeah. play warhammer and it's like okay well i've got like 30 guys on this side and they're like 10 the two custodies on the enemy team <laughs> And there is this dissonance between the scale that the setting is and the scale that the game is. So I started looking to very small scale war games because at, at one point I was quite uh, unable to continue to buy, uh, you know, 28 millimeter models. I also was running out of space in, um, you know, my ability to keep them. Uh, you can only keep so many uh, Mortarian models. <laughs> uh, uh, great model, but yeah, anyway. So I was looking into small scale wargaming and that's when I discovered like a lot of that six millimeter and under and that changed my perspective on how I thought about war games. Because just because the scale is small doesn't mean the rules are complicated. And there are a lot of games that you can play that are actually quick at a very small scale and they feel like you're fighting an actual battle. So possibly I would like to have you on at some point maybe to talk about six millimeter gaming because I'm, I'm a big fan of skirmish games and I'm also a big fan of these mass games. I've moved away really from the 28 millimeter scale, uh, the quote unquote, the heroic scale, uh, just because I think it has some of the worst aspects of, you know, like model creep. You've got these big models that are ungainly, but you kind of need them. Or, you know, there's too many models to move individually. You know, on a skirmish game, it's fine because you just have like 10 guys or five guys. But if you've got an army of 50, it can, can be kind of cumbersome to move them. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tangent. I think, yeah. I think we can, well, uh, yeah. 
Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you're, you're definitely hitting on, there's a lot of issues with the sort of heroic scale. Um, with that 28 millimeter uh, miniature scale, yeah, certainly. Um, fantasy suffered from it a lot with the sort of movement trays. I've never oh, really yeah. been a fan. I've never really been a fan of that, and it's always been a problem with like rank and flank games mm -hmm. uh, that have, that suffer from that. So maybe maybe six millimeters is the way. I think my problem is, for one, I think a lot of people really enjoy the painting side of mm. things, and I I imagine the six millimeter <laughs> miniatures just aren't as fun. <laughs> to paint. Okay, uh, so here's where I uh, have to lose all my war games, right? I don't paint the six millimeter. <laughs> I just I just leave the bases. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I have bad eyesight, so you know. Painting at that small scale is hard for me, but like when I zoom out from the table, I can kind of, I tell, I, I know where everything is. I just have like a splash of paint on the base so that I know this is my side, that's the enemy side. But I do, I totally agree with you. I do think that like there are plenty of people who just want to paint miniatures and I don't know if the six millimeter scale is for them. But for people who just want a game, I feel like maybe. It kind of reminds me of if you're ever playing like an RTS game and you just want to keep zooming out <laughs> as much as possible, you know, to see yeah. as much of the, of the map as... And you're right, there is a there is a big dissonance between the sort of the lore and the world of Warhammer and the games. Um, like you said, the scale of things are always a much lower in the, scale, in the actual game as opposed to the lore. And I think a lot of people get around that by imagining that the sort of elements of the game that's happening in front of them mm -hmm. is only one part of a larger battle. That's always been the way that it's sort of been sold to me. Yeah. And, and then there was obviously the emergence of Armageddon as well um, in the 2000s when it was massive scale and you had 28 millimeter models and it was so ungainly oh, and impossible yeah. <laughs> and it took like three days to play and it just wasn't fun yeah. and it was just the spectacle of the thing but it just wasn't a good game at that level yeah you would love to open the white dwarf and look at an apocalypse level battle uh but you wouldn't want to actually play it <laughs> yeah you, you wouldn't want to be there and playing it 100 percent um it's just just not great i think that's kind of the reason why adeptus titanicus has really taken off uh, because I, everyone that I know that plays Titanicus loves it. Everyone loves the models. Everyone loves the scale. Uh, because you actually get to feel like you're fighting with Titans. Um, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it, the, we, we might do another episode about 6mm gaming. Um, sure. So yeah, you know, we brought up a lot of... Uh, you, you brought up the, you know, Star Wars previously. I do think that Star Wars is probably the only other IP that really has a chance you know, against Games Workshop. Um, but in a way, uh, Games Workshop are kind of like a mirror to Lucasfilm, where the Star Wars movies, the thing that launched the franchise, are not the biggest money makers for the franchise anymore. It's the merchandise, it's the theme parks, it's comic books, video games, although they haven't made as many video games recently. But it's clear that uh, Disney recognized that the Star Wars brand is actually just a vessel for selling other things besides the movies. I feel almost in a way that they make the movies uh, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of the sequel trilogy. I think it has a lot of issues in terms of its storytelling, in terms of its pacing. Um, it's not because they added women to it. Star Wars should have had women <laughs> in it way earlier, you know? <laughs> it's just, they didn't do a good job because I just feel like it wasn't in them, you know, to tell a creative story. But I think Games Workshop have kind of realized that, uh, you know, they are reaching kind of the end of what they can get out of just selling minis, you know, because... Games Workshop are unique in the sense that I think they're one of the few games companies that are actually publicly traded. You can actually buy Games Workshop stock. Yeah. And so they have shareholders. They have people who don't just want more prop they don't just want a profit on their investment. They want more profit on their investment. And so I feel like there is part of the behavior, you know, from uh, maybe a, a, a sort of a material sense is that they have to produce these increasing returns. And I think that one of the reasons why there's a shift to a media company is because they realize that they're kind of reaching the limit of what they can do with war games. Do you think that's fair? I, th I think it is to some extent. I think that the IP is always something that they have acknowledged that they have that's very unique mm -hmm. to them and they've known that they could leverage it. For example, the Black Library, that always arose. That was the series of books that they, they sell. They sell a lot of books set in the Warhammer world. And that, that sort of arose organically out of the game whereas the sort of new strain of animations and this whole warhammer plus mm -hmm. elements that they're sort of trying to push very hard um it feels like a more artificial sort of attempt to grab at market share beyond what they maybe you know have right now 
In terms of miniatures, though, I will say that I think there's a lot more space for them to grow in the miniature space. Hmm. And I think that's something that they know as well, because they've only really started in the last two years from really penetrating the American marketplace. And now they're looking to march into China and Asia as well. So uh. they're trying to do a similar thing there. So I think that they do feel like there's a lot more money to be made in the miniature space. And that's why there's lots of people who say that that Games Workshop want to get out of the miniature space entirely, that they just want to focus on moving into like animation and hitting the mainstream much more. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. I think they do want to maintain their position in the miniature wargaming market um, because it makes them lots of money. They have monetized it really effectively, but they do want to grab much more market share by creating and expanding the marketplace. Yeah, and that's I... I totally agree with you. I think that some of the people who think that Games Workshop are totally, you know, gonna dump all the models. I think those people are being uh, a little over uh, zealous, maybe, uh, in their uh, dislike of Games Workshop. Because I think it's a nice fantasy that Games Workshop are gonna go out of the models industry and they're just gonna be a media company. And But I don't think that's actually true. Because as you said, they're very good at it. They would be leaving a lot of money on the table, you know, because the minute Games Workshop decide to stop selling Warhammer miniatures, other companies will step up to sell Warhammer miniatures, you know? Um, and if they can get money out of it, that's great. What I didn't think of, and I, that, that's actually a good point, is that I didn't realize that Games Workshop could expand into Asia and also into America more than they could have. I didn't really think about that. How, why do you, how do you think they, they could do that? Well, in terms of the USA, I mean, they've started doing that in a really big deal. I mean, I think that in in one way, the way they're doing it is funny enough, is by expanding the media that they that they engage in. Mm -hmm. So the rise of video games, if you remember, it, they were very they used to be very reluctant to put, uh, sell their IP or uh, license their IP mm -hmm. to games companies, and it's only in the last like five or six years that we've really seen them just go whole hog and just license it to anybody who from what i can tell asks it <laughs> politely you know sends them a single email you send them an email and i think you can walk away with the warhammer ip for a mobile game because they just it seems like there is a new mobile game coming out every other week oh yeah it's all and, and, nonsense oh yeah and it, it's actually in a lot of ways i actually think it's quite dangerous for them because i think it's diluting their ip yeah it used to be the case that when you saw a warhammer game was coming out that video game that is used to be like okay this this will be good but now it, it's just going to be trash and yeah. I, I think most people expect it to be trash um but they're making money right they're making a lot of money because they're mobile games and it doesn't matter what happens in a mobile game for some reason they're able to make too much money entirely uh, mobile games and the success of them i think prove that there's something really wrong with the way that human humans like human psychology can be manipulated for profit because i feel like mobile games demonstrate that like yeah we are kind of very susceptible to very cheap tricks yes 100 percent um i completely agree with you and so i think that by expanding the ip there they're exposing people to the ip which is an interesting and good ip so people become curious and they get involved in warhammer and I think that's how they're majorly doing it in the USA. Mm -hmm. um, I think the expansion of stores as well, they're opening up more stores in Asia mm -hmm. and they're basically trying to penetrate the market through sales techniques in the same way that they did in the, in the UK. They're doing it slightly different now. So in the UK, when they first started, they were very aggressive in where they would position their stores. Everything ran through the Games Workshop store, but this is back in the 90s and the 2000s. They don't really need to do that now. Now it's all about uh, now it's all about sales online. And from what I understand, employees at Games Workshop stores are now being instructed to focus on new hobbyists, trying to get new people into the hobby mm. as opposed to focusing on selling to existing hobbyists. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, the Asia market, the Asian market, uh, sorry, the Asian market is very much untapped uh, when it yeah. comes to this kind of thing. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, wargaming has kind of been a bit of an Anglo centric hobby. Uh, it has been something that is largely, when I think of war games, I don't, I think primarily of places like the UK, maybe a little bit of the United States. Uh, you know, I, I think of those kinds of places. But the reality is war games are a universal thing, right? I think everyone and anyone should be able to play a war game. Uh, and the, I, I think that because of, uh, you know, uh, the lack of penetration of other war games companies in Asia, if Games Workshop were able to actually get something like that, you know, down, 
that would represent an explosion of their potential in terms of profit making. And I, I think that kind of worries me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I completely, I, I understand your feeling on that one. Um, but yeah, it, it is what it is, I suppose, in a lot of ways. Um, on the one hand, I, 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 I'm really excited for that, right? Because I think that the hobby getting bigger is really good. I think there's a lot of benefits to the hobby. And I, I think it's very easy to sell the hobby to someone. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Games Workshop being the, the tip of the spear of that is a little bit terrifying because they don't exactly celebrate the best bits of the hobby. And I think just in terms of geography, I mean, that's one that's one thing, getting into the Asian market and the US market. But they're also, I think, trying to shake a little bit of the, uh, I suppose, the reputation that miniature wargaming has mm. in the sort of wider marketplace. There's very much a perception that miniature wargaming is, well, for one, I think that uh, historical miniatures definitely has a reputation for being of uh, older, uh, older hobbyists yeah. or maybe hostile to you know, uh, anyone who doesn't fit the sort of white uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant <laughs> style, um, the wasp, right? And I think that goes in hand in hand with the perception that it's always been a very middle class hobby. Oh, yeah. I think, in, I think in the last sort of 20 years, that has begun to change a lot. It's no longer perceived as only for that, or at least Games Workshop are working very hard to reduce that sort of uh, impression that people get, which is a good thing, but it is designed to maximize profit for them. Yeah, they it's are not a charitable thing. Yeah, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. They are responding to market incentives and they recognize that if they can get more people to play war games, like for example, if they can get more women to play war games, then they will get more money. Um, I hate to say yeah. this, but uh, ideology only goes so far when it comes to uh, you know the bottom line. <laughs> And, uh, you know, a Games Workshop might, like, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's that company? Activision Blizzard. So recently it came out that Activision Blizzard had a tremendously toxic work environment. Yeah. But, of course, Activision Blizzard will tell you that they want to sell products to women. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, they are aggressively anti-woman, you know, in the kind of work culture that they espouse, uh, that they allow to develop. And that's because, yeah, they recognize that not selling to half the people on the planet is, you know, crazy. It, it's not a winning business strategy, certainly. Um, but you're also right in the sense that the trends around historical don't necessarily seem to be uh, changing all that much. Uh, at least from, you know, it's hard to get data on this, right? It's very hard to get data on this precisely yeah. uh, because, you know, war gamers tend to be uh, relatively niche. It's hard to find large scale, you know, surveys. I think there's a few, um, but they, it, it seems to be the case that what Games Workshop want to do, and I, I know they even released a, a kids, a kid friendly, which is kind of crazy when you think about like what Warhammer 40k is, but trying to make that kid friendly is just, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I have a lot of conflicted thoughts on those, on those books. I don't know what my, what my opinion is on them yet. I've been yeah. thinking about them for like three years now and I still don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, on the one hand, I do, I would like everyone, you know, to play war games. I think anyone can play war games. Uh, if you're like 10 years old, you can play a war game. On the other hand, should you really be trying to make the fascist regime seem kid friendly? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of yeah. complicated. And, and I suppose that, that goes hand in hand with how they're changing the setting in a lot of ways. They're sort of celebrating a lot of the characters. Like Space Marines are, I think, increasingly so being positioned as just an, you know, unproblematic uh, oh, yeah. savior. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I've seen the early days of Rogue Trader. I've seen what the Space Marines were depicted as. They were depicted as incredibly authoritarian, incredibly brutal cops, basically, in space. Um, and now we look at them today, and it's like they have the cool armor, the shiny guns. The Primaris Marines are like the Boy Scouts, you know, in a way. It doesn't seem to be that they emphasize the more problematic as aspects of you know, 40k and the more problematic ways in which the environment is kind of, you know, sort of catered. Because, again, I think it's fine that the Imperium is a fascist dictatorship, provided the setting is able to acknowledge that, I think. Yes, yes, exactly. The danger, the danger is Take that, yeah, yeah, the danger is that you have a setting where the Imperium is still a fascist dictatorship, because it kind of has to be. Uh, and, you know, the Imperium can't reason with anyone, you know, there's only war, yada, yada, yada. 
But then on the other hand, you're like, okay, but they're they're not really shown to be the bad guys. It's not really shown to be, you know, that these guys are problematic in a very serious, meaningful way, right? That you shouldn't be rooting for them. Because my, my, my big concern is a lot of, especially on YouTube and places like that, if you go to see any 40k content, there will be loads of people in that comment section, which you should never look at, by the way, but loads of people in that comment section talking about how the Imperium is right and how everything that they do is based and, you know, how, yeah. you know, how sometimes if you go into particularly darker corners of the world, how people, we should be, uh, you know, certain countries should be more like the Imperium. I'm like, hold up, <laughs> hold up. How did we get here? We have to turn the car around. We have to, we have to do something about yeah. this. Um, another, well, it's, it's a- oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say it's a, a big thing about the Imperium as well. I think that people really miss is the fact that it's utterly incompetent. Yeah. As, as a system of government, it's utterly ineffectual at what it sets out to do. It's incredibly inefficient and it's just incompetent in how it distributes its resources. And this is a huge element, I think, that gets completely overlooked. The Imperial bureaucracy is this Byzantine alien sort of menace that basically issues out edicts from a centralized government at a galactic level. Yeah. It doesn't work at all. But this gets celebrated in a lot of the fiction and amongst a lot of the fan base um, because I think it's just a simplistic reading. And I also think the tone of the sort of newer stuff just implies that what the Imperium is doing is necessary when a lot of what they're doing isn't necessary and sort of creates a lot of the problems for themselves. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, I think a YouTuber by the name of Say Hi Paul, who does pretty good uh, let's uh, no, let's face it, <laughs> battle reports. He said something to the effect of like, uh, who's the biggest threat to the Imperium? He says, what? Uh, after the Imperium, you mean, you know? <laughs> uh, and it's hard to get that across in a video game because of course, a problem inside of Games Workshop's uh, way that they've set everything up is that basically half the armies are Imperium. Like, basically yeah. everyone plays Space Marines, or most people play Space Marines, which means that you don't really get to see outside perspectives of the Imperium if, like, half the players in the game are going to be a Guard player, a Sisters of Battle player, a Space Marine player, you know? Like, that's not healthy for the hobby if half of the available factions in this massive, expansive universe are all basically kind of the same. I think that is a real issue. And also, you know, it, it player satisfaction, because it seems like everyone's ninth edition codex is not that great, you know. It's powerful for a couple of weeks, and then there's an errata that drops, and suddenly stuff gets nerfed. I, I know, I'm, I'm a Doc Eldar player, I, I'm enjoying mine. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> excuse <laughs> okay, excuse but, me, I'm still waiting for a Tau codex to drop. Oh, wow, well, yeah, you'll be waiting a while, I yeah. think. Um, so, I mean, I think this speaks to the material reality of Games Workshop, right? So mm-hmm. they sell Space Marines because they perceive Space Marines as being the most popular faction. Um, I think that there's obviously a little bit of uh, chicken and egg here mm-hmm. in terms of they support it a lot more. So therefore, people play Space Marines because they want to have a faction that will always be supported, yep. especially in an ecosystem like Games Workshops where there's a new book every other month. Yeah. And so they want to ensure that they have an army that's relevant. So I've had Dark Eldar for a while. Um, I have always enjoyed Dark Eldar because of the theme and narrative of them. And then, you know, there's a long time where they're just not relevant. And now suddenly they're like really good, but that's not going to last forever. Whereas if I'm a Space Marine player, I'm pretty much guaranteed that there will always be new models coming out for Space Marines. Mm-hmm. So that really incentivizes people to play them. And then that really incentivizes Games Workshop to continue to make more. And it's just this sort of parasitic yeah. relationship almost. I, I, one feed I absolutely wanted to start an Eldar army, but most of the models are like older than <laughs> I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I would be with you there, uh, you know, playing uh, an Eldar army. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's something we could try with Tabletop Simulator at some point. Uh, that yeah. that would be a fun stream idea uh, to, to to first Eldar versus Dark Eldar because I like the Eldar I think they're pretty cool I like their aesthetics I like how every Eldar is basically just like a citizen you know they don't have a professional army I think that's pretty awesome I love the colors the colors are are pretty but their models are so old and their rule every battle report when an Eldar player is like oh they'll play the objectives but they'll get killed at the end of the tur- the game it's like I don't really ah uh. yeah you know it's- yeah. One of the funny things about the Eldar being so neglected is to me, in my mind, I've always imagined the Eldar as being like one of the big, you know, top, top level factions, right? Mm-hmm. One of the big uh, signpost factions that this is Warhammer 40k. Oh, yeah. I've always thought it's been like Space Marines, uh, Eldar were always like 
maybe second or third to me, right? They're the space elves. They're like a massive component of the setting. Yeah, for uh, for me, my first introduction to any Warhammer property was the High Elf book for Warhammer Fantasy. And I love that book. Uh, it was so great. It was like looking at every sort of fantasy thing that I wanted, you know, my uh, child brain. And then I found out about the Eldar. I was like, oh, I get that, but in space? Awesome. <laughs> and then I tried to learn about the rules. And then it's just like, okay, so your rules are really hard. Uh, you know, your armies are difficult to play. Your model range is basically unsupported. I, I would, you know, I, I, in a way, Games Workshop is kind of shooting themselves in the foot here because by selectively biasing space brains and, you know, sort of Imperium players, they really are keeping out other people who probably, you know, be as interested in other factions, you know, um, who just get turned away because, you know, Games Workshop are trying to get everyone in, but they almost kind of want everyone to play Space Marines in a way. Well, yeah, because it's super interesting because I think elves as a sort of fantasy archetype or as a, a sort of folk are always super popular, right? Like elves are like one of the most popular sort of factions in sort of general yeah. Tolkien-esque you know, if you ever think of any MMO RPG mm -hmm. games, right? Elves are always like one of the top, top level ones, like in terms of population. So it's always been strange to me that uh, Eldar are neglected so much by Games Workshop. Um, it really is just space brain blinkers. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very strange. You know, the model range in particular, I feel like is one of the biggest tra travesties because an Eldar model range for me should really indicate what Games Workshop should be about. I mean, sorry, what Warhammer should be about. You should see something that is a blend of science fiction and fantasy, you know? Yeah. Um, you should be looking at, like, a flying tank that is covered in, like, magic ruins. Or, you know, a warrior who's got, like, crazy-looking weapons, but they're actually a robot, you know, powered by a, a soul. And it's stuff like that that's like, hey, wait a minute, this could be really cool. What about the models? And then the models, most of them are you know, hard to come by. Some of them are metal. I don't like working with metal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I completely agree. I, I started on uh, metal Sisters of Battle in 2004, mm -hmm. and it almost put me off the entire hobby. Whoa. I was like, nope, I don't want to work with this anymore. And then I moved on to Imperial Guard, and I got into it proper. But yeah, metal metal models are not for me. I, I'm prejudiced against them now, just because they were the first thing I started <laughs> with. I, uh, I had a uh... I was lucky in the sense that when I started playing uh, Warhammer, I could just buy the elf kit, the elf, you know, uh, plastic box sets. But like I've had, I've de dealt with metal models. They're a pain, at least for me to paint. I don't like how heavy they are. Uh, it, it's difficult to transport. Um, there are some people who swear by them, right? I, I guarantee yeah. there are some people who, who in the comments of this video will probably swear by them. But like for Infinity me, it's just... players, <laughs> a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, speaking of models, I think this is a great segue into the final part, and that is the effects of 3D printing on Games Workshop. So I have an opinion, which I think is kind of a spicy opinion, maybe in, in sort of our circles, uh, but why don't you tell me, do you think that 3D printing is really going to be the game changer? Are we actually going to see the end of Games Workshop because of 3D printing? Um, so in terms of just my overall opinion on 3D printing, I sort of go back and forth on this. Mm. I, I think that, um, I don't think that we're ever going to see the end of Games Workshop because of 3D printing. I don't actually think that they'll be threatened that much mm. um, by it. So you, I think you mentioned in the intro about, uh, or you might have mentioned earlier, that in terms of 3D printing, I do see it. Now, I don't think that, you know, maybe there's ethically that it's the same, but I do see it very akin to sort of piracy and the question of piracy that the music and the movie and the video game industry had to sort of grapple with in the early 21st century and how they dealt and how they, you know, responded to piracy. And it turned out that if you just make things affordable and easy to access, most people will purchase your things that you're selling and they'll be happy to do that and they won't actually try to get things for free or figure out you know these complicated processes to get things if we look at that in the context of miniatures i think 3d printing is a huge a huge hobby in and of itself mm -hmm. i think there is so much effort so much time and effort and dedicated study that goes into 3d printing and so i think games workshop are pretty much safe from the long-term sort of uh bad aspects, I suppose, for lack of a better term, hmm. that 3D printing, you know, any adverse impacts that they might feel from 3D printing. I think that Games Workshop are in a sort of position where they might get impacted from 3D printing more in the sense that people will sell uh, counts as models already. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they're already feeling the effects of that or 
bits, uh, what are known as bits, and mm -hmm. bits are essentially little um, sort of uh, things like little like a gun pouches. or a sword. Yeah, exactly. Just little elements that you can use to customize your models. I think that that is probably the future of 3D printing, where it pertains to 40k. Um, I think that you're not going to find that every hobbyist has a 3D printer in their house. Yeah. Um, 3D printing is a lot of effort. It is also uh, it, it's quite problematic in terms of it lets out fumes, so you need to figure out ventilation. I think in terms of health impact, that's actually not been completely. We're not sure mm -hmm. if there's any sort of long-term health impacts from some of those fumes. So you have to be very careful in terms of ventilation and you know wearing a mask and things like that for certain types of printers. Yeah. So I, I should say that there's a lot of different types of printers. I'm not an expert in 3D printing by any means because I don't have the space for one. And the, that fact is one of the things that I think that protects games workshop i don't have the space for one they are expensive and there requires a lot of thought that goes into buying one so i don't think the majority of hobbyists are ever going to pick one up that said you know 3d printers they get a, they get more accessible every year i think five years ago if you had to ask me is there going to be lots and lots of 3d printers everywhere and will there be absolutely beautiful models being printed out in people's mm. homes i would have said probably not not anytime soon but it's happened a lot faster than mm. i thought especially in terms of the quality of the models I think that the future for 3D printing looks probably more like Etsy stores, yeah. where people will be selling bespoke models to hobbyists using 3D printing. I think we'll see a greater variety of miniatures that are possible. I think that we've already seen the start of Patreon models for mm -hmm. STL files, which are the files that people use. They print them out on the 3D printers. I think that that's going to definitely continue. But I don't think long term that, that Games Workshop are going to be any real threat not existentially to mm. 3D printing. So uh, I think that's a very interesting opinion. Uh, actually, I was to say, you know, uh, it's actually very close to my own opinion. Uh, just for my own, you know, sort of uh, take on 3D printing, I'm very interested in the technology, but I don't have the space for one. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, I feel like 3D printing is its own separate hobby. And yeah. just like how there are some people who get into war games and they basically paint, and they do a little bit of playing here and there, but they, you know, mostly paint. For me, I only really care about the playing. I don't really care all that much about where, you know, about my models. You know, I don't really care too much about that kind of thing. So if I can get better models in a more accessible way, I'll get it. It's fine. But if, like you said, you know, piracy is a matter of accessibility. If Games Workshop had better prices, I don't think it would bother me as much, right? But because they yeah. don't, because they have this very anti-consumer, uh, one of their worst. Uh, the tactics is to factor in the rarity or the power quote unquote, of the model into the price, which is yeah. ridiculous, <laughs> right? Um, Warlord games, every like 20, you, if you're buying a Warlord games, you're not buying like, uh, you know, if I'm buying uh, American Civil War, I'm not paying more because the Confederates, uh, you know, were, um, you know, quote unquote, uh, uh, this or that, you know, you're just paying 20 uh, pounds, I think it is for like, a box of models and you get the same amount regardless of the faction and they all have options and i think there are definitely ways that they should be doing to you know improve that but on the other hand i do think that you're totally right i think that even though 3d printing is getting more accessible they aren't like star trek replicators yet maybe they could yeah. be but i think it's important to have some historical perspective because i think there are a lot of people who make an argument that uh, a disruption in an industry is actually the end of that industry but I think if we just look at some other industries, uh, we can find that that's not quite the case. Like, for example, uh, Netflix. Uh, Netflix was a disruption of the traditional way of viewing content online. And I think when I first heard about Netflix, I think a lot of people were saying, hey, this is the end of TV, right? This is the end yeah. of uh, broadcast companies. And what happened was for a brief window of time, all of the shows were on Netflix. It was great. But then very quickly, many of the other companies realized that they could open their own streaming services. They started pulling content from Netflix. The experience of Netflix went down and Netflix wasn't able to actually produce enough content on its own in its totality, right? You, Netflix wasn't able to produce all of the shows that are on it. So then, you know, um, you had HBO, Disney, they have their own streaming services, their own shows, and now everyone is split amongst multiple streaming services to just get to watch what they want to watch, you know? It's a tragedy. Yeah, it, it, is, what it, it is. is a tragedy because it demonstrates that just because you are able to disrupt an industry with a new technology, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get rid of that industry. Facebook, another great example. Yeah, they are the most popular news platform on the world and they use it to make everyone's life worse. <laughs> <laughs> but Facebook 
got rid of the old monopolies of print media and it is the new monopoly. So my my own sort of sentiment is that it is nice to think about the idea that we could democratize, you know, this whole kind of thing. But I think the average person is not really going to spend all that much because it is a lot of work, right? You know, modeling or even, you know, getting, you know, buying, paying people to, you know, get models or, you know, finding the STL files. Um, I think uh, another example would be gaming, right? It's probably easier now more than ever to make a video game, but EA is not not one of the most profitable com companies on the planet for no reason, right? Yeah. Uh, I do actually think that uh, the where where 3D printing can offer a lot of value is, of course, in providing uh, bits, right? I don't want to buy another box just to get another sword. I would rather maybe just 3D print, you know, pay someone to give me a, a 3D printed sword. I also think that bespoke 3D printing companies could definitely be a thing. I also think that maybe Games Workshop could probably become a have a 3D printing service on demand. You yeah. know, one of the problems with their way that they do their models is you just can't get many of the old models, right? I feel like something that maybe could be done is they could you just basically have a 3D printing division inside of their regular sort of, you know, uh, uh, costing system or whatever, and just 3D print models on demand. Because I feel like a lot of people do want those models. Because the, the uh. unfortunate reality is that Games Workshop is a very powerful company, and they have a lot of capital that they can use on projects. So they can hire artists to work full time making miniatures that are really good and cool that everyone wants to play with. And they can spend you know money on writers that they, 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 they should pay all of these people more, of course, but they have the capital to throw around on projects that small companies do not. And, you know, this ties up to the, you know, kind of monopoly position. I feel like they can, if they can kind of basically whip themselves into a better shape and bring back, you know, people who might have been swayed by a 3D printer. I totally agree with you. Um, I totally agree with you there. And I think the thing is, is that they're going to incorporate this technology into how they do business. It's not going to sort of, you know, wound them um, terminally at all. And I think that right now we're sort of at the upswing of 3D printing. Like mm -hmm. we're, we're beginning to get into what will probably be seen in the future as the golden age of 3D printing. So we're seeing the, you know, rise of all sorts of different uh, smaller companies and smaller just collections of mm -hmm. people or individuals who are selling STL files and people are printing them in the home. I don't know if that will last necessarily forever. I've seen it, the rise and fall of sort of indie games, mm -hmm. right? So, and like you said, Netflix as well. There was a t time there where you could subscribe to Netflix and you could get everything you wanted to see ever. And it only cost you, you know, like uh, $10. Yeah. And now it's, you know, you have to subscribe to 20 different services and it's completely ruined the experience and it's, you know, there's no joy in it any, anymore. I think once companies like Games Workshop begin to get into 3D printing, they're going to muscle out the smaller companies because this often happens, as you say, they have the capital to throw around on these things. And we'll see what happens. I hope that isn't the case. And I'll always be championing yeah. the smaller 3D companies. <laughs> but I mean, to be frank, Games Workshop have gotten away with a lot. And I think that they can, can continue to get away with quite a lot of aggressively anti-consumer practices yeah. in the future. And I think this will probably be one of them. I think, uh, yeah, no, I, with the failure of the Games Workshop boycott, I think what this has really demonstrated is that I don't think we can actually get rid of Games Workshop anymore. I think the actual way forward is to make it so that we can actually change Games Workshop for the better. And, uh, you know, I do want to pick your brain on this uh, because I think that the, the way to go forward is to encourage a greater unionization inside the industry, right? I feel like because... A lot of the uh, practices that happen that are anti-consumer from Games Workshop, I feel they come from the upper management. They come up from on high, down low. And I don't necessarily think that all the workers in Games Workshop really want to do that. I feel like if you're a modeler who worked really hard on, you know, like a Eldar miniature, you don't want it to be so expensive that people can't afford to buy it, you know? And I feel like if the Games Workshop were more unionized, if their writers, their animators, their modelers, etc., were unionized, then those people could actually exert the kinds of pressures that could get Games Workshop to change. Because consumers were kind of very fickle, and Games Workshop has a global audience, so it's yeah. very hard to organize us to do something to get them to change. And, you know, we're not the shareholders, so Games Workshop are not going to directly listen to us. Provided enough people keep buying, they can weather a lot of storms because they have a very large net, you know, that maybe another war games company would go under, you know, like if there was a large-scale riot or, you know... Uh, 
uh, uproar amongst the community. But I feel like Games Workshop is large enough that if we want them to get better, what we have to do is change them basically from the inside. We have to get them to form a union there. That's going to be the way that we can pressure Games Workshop into being better because they can't function if those people, the workers inside the, you know, the, the company, aren't actually working. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting idea. I'm not sure if I necessarily agree, though. Hmm. Um, I think that, generally speaking, uh, the miniature wargaming industry, same for the tabletop role-playing industry, basically any hobby industry, video games, anything where there's some sort of uh, desire, people want to work in it hmm. because it, you know, they, they're fans of the products within it. Um, they tend to have a hard time, you know, with unionization. They tend yeah. to have a hard time with pay as well, for example, as people's passion gets sort of, you know, exploited. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a big thing. Now, obviously, the discourse on this is sort of changing um, video games. I know there's been talk of unionization in that industry for the longest time. I really hope that we see some movement on that. Mm -hmm. Very recently, uh, Peso um, formed a... Uh, yeah, the of, Pathfinder uh, company. Yeah, and so that's really interesting. And I hope that leads to some changes in the wider industry um, that we'll see as we go forward other companies unionizing as well. Because... And, Another aspect of this will just be freelancers as well, mm -hmm. whether or not they'll be able to be included in these unions, because I think that very much the industry as a whole runs off the back of freelancers. So I don't think we'll see much substantial uh, changes for anyone, you know, obviously outside those workers who are mm -hmm. able to negotiate pay, for example. I don't think we'll see much wider changes to the industry without freelancers to some extent being accommodated for in this mm -hmm. model. Sure. But in terms of workshops, I think one of the things to remember about Games Workshop is that they're based in the UK. And unlike the, you know, for example, maybe the United States, there isn't as much of a prejudice against things like unions. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, there's definitely, from my understanding of it, there is definitely a narrative that is very anti-union. And so it's very hard to convince people to belong to unions. But workers at Games Workshop, I mean, they have the option to join uh, all sorts of general unions. In fact, and this is something I'm not sure about, they might even be unionized already. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm not 100% sure. Hmm. And the thing about it is, is that I think, yes, 100%, a lot of these issues are coming from the top down. I think this is very much at the managerial level. And in fact, I don't even think it's, you know, I don't even think it's the creative leads or anything that want to do some of these elements. Um, for example, Warlord Games, Rick Priestley left Games Workshop yeah. because he fed up with the sort of design of Warhammer 40K. He wanted to innovate on it, but yeah. Games Workshop as, as a company wanted to continue to, you know, to process seals. They, they, uh, they pulled an ad mech. Yes, exactly. Um, so Rick Priestley left Games Workshop. And you do see that a lot. I mean, I think a lot of the, the better miniature game companies, you know, in, in the industry were started by maybe yeah, yeah. uh, ex-employees of Games Workshop, Perry Miniatures as yeah. well, right? So I think that that's typically the sort of funnel for people who don't like the way Games Workshop do things. They start up their own companies. But yes, definitely, you know, there needs to be change within Games Workshop. I'm not sure whether or not that will happen for unionization hmm. specifically. I think a lot of this speaks to, unfortunately, the sort of structure of companies. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks to the, the wider structures that Games Workshop operate within. The fact that they're a public company, they have shareholders, and those shareholders consist either of, you know, tiny individual shareholders who can't really exert any power on Games Workshop. You know, I might own shares in Games Workshop, but there's nothing I can do to stop them from making another codex for Space Marines yeah. anytime soon. Um, or it's massive fund groups, you know, that yeah. are pension funds. Hedge funds that have no, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, they have no interest in the day-to-day -day running of the company itself. So long as it turns a profit, they don't care about responsibility or, you know, game design or, or any of these aspects. Yeah. Or sustainability, right? Um, because Games Workshop talk a lot about, you know, long term and how they're, they're a company that looks to the long term. But that's just talk, I think. Uh, it's just narrative that they like to tell themselves. So I don't think that necessarily, to be honest, I think that you do need to see some change. I think that it's going to definitely be hard to have change from consumers because, as you say, there's very few consumers who are actually plugged into a lot of this. I think mm -hmm. the majority of people are just casual players who just want to, you know, collect a, an army and they want to paint their miniatures and they want to play with them every so often. And that, to some extent, is fine. It's just that they get impacted yeah. by a lot of these, you know, bad things. The, the you know, they're they're impacted adversely by through this. Oh yeah. Um, and so it, it's really important to try and create a consciousness of some kind because awareness of these facts 
do breed resistance. And I think that we've mm. seen that in the last two years, the hobby's gotten bigger, but also critical voices in the community have gotten louder as well. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that that will have some impact. I think the Games Workshop have to come, become more responsive. It's happened before where they have done so, and they've turned things around in terms of the company. Uh, they, they were, you know, they, they've been through rough patches before in the past and very much alienated the community. And that has really, that has caused them issues in the yeah. past. So, and I think that we're heading there again. I think that they're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. My concern is that they do go into this sort of media, the shift towards a media company. Um, and if they begin to make a lot of money in that area, well, then the miniature comp side of things will become a little bit more of an afterthought. And so we as miniature, you know, hobbyists, as consumers of miniature products, we're going to have a lot less power to, yeah. to get things changed. Yeah, of course. Um, and that that's a concern of mine going long term so I, th I think we have to be a little bit lighter now yeah. so that we don't have to you know so that we can actually affect those changes you know of course and uh, one last thing i would say is that i think that a big thing that would impact games workshop is just having more competition mm -hmm. in the miniature industry space um obviously there's lots of companies i just think that you know hobbies need to begin to try and support them um and i think just awareness of other companies is a really big deal because so many people still even to this day aren't aware of those other companies and so by making them aware i hope that you know things will change yeah um so to, to, to speak to a couple of the points, firstly, uh, if you're looking for an alternative to more time, I would recommend playing a game called Frostgrave, uh, ah, yeah. which is a, a pretty interesting one. Uh, it's fairly sort of skirmish fantasy kind of gameplay, but it is a lot uh, more agnostic in terms of the setting, at least uh, you know, in the way that I play it. Uh, but I do also agree with you. I think that, um, you know, um, I, I definitely would like... I am, I am being overly optimistic, of course, in, in sort of the sense, I think, with unionization. I don't think unionization can fundamentally solve a lot of the contradictions inside of Games Workshop. Uh, I think it is just one of many tools. You know, in my ideal world, Games Workshop would be something like a worker cooperative, but that's not happening anytime soon, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think that a lot of the problems that we see with Games Workshop could be fixed if there was a greater uh, flattening of the hierarchy between the people who are doing, like, the modeling work and the people who are making sort of the financial decisions, right? And also, I do think that, uh, you know, there are plenty of investors in the company who really, you're right, they don't care about what's going on. They just want to make sure that the number, you know, goes up. Um, and I think that uh, in terms of the way that we have to think about what we can do, it is probably a good idea to, to think about Games Workshop trying to have some competitors. I just worry that they kind of have a particular monopoly on certain things, you know, because like Star Wars Legion wasn't actually as big of a game as I thought it would actually be. Yeah. And that worried me because it's Star Wars and it didn't really get anywhere, you know? I remember, uh, I'm not sure if you remember War Machine, uh, War Mahords, uh, you know, Iron Kingdoms. I thought that was going to yeah. be big. I, I remember telling all of my friends, hey guys, you know, we're getting tired of Games Workshop. Why don't we all play this game? It's got steampunk robots. And now a couple of years later, eh, you know, it, it's not exactly a, a popular game system anymore. And I feel like one of the issues is that Games Workshop exists as the first of the titans, you know? They're really a titan in the war games industry, in an industry that hasn't really had them before, you know? And so I worry that we are kind of stuck in a way with Games Workshop in the sense that they are the largest, they do have a lot of capital to survive things that maybe other companies wouldn't have, and they they have a, a, a recognition and a brand that that gives them a kind of power, which means that they have to be challenged by something as powerful. Maybe, I guess, you know, in the UK, maybe there could be government regulation, you know, uh, to some extent, but I don't think that's happening either. Um, no, probably not. <laughs> so maybe, maybe what we have to do is sort of seek a plur plur plurality of tactics. We have to encourage you know the workers inside of games workshop to be a little bit more vocal when the company does something that they don't like uh, we have to encourage war gamers to be more critical uh you know uh, ab about games workshop and to engage in ecosystems in the way that historical war games because what really should happen is uh there should be the ecosystem around historical war games in the same way that there is the ecosystem around you know fantasy or sci-fi games but there just isn't that yet and we have to encourage that so obviously you know uh dealing with competitors um, yeah, and maybe there is a role for some sort of, sort of limited sort of government interven intervention. Although, you know, we can't regulate video games. I can't imagine if we could regulate war games. Yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely not. Um, and yeah, 
it, it kind of feels like Games Workshop are trapped in a bit of a cycle, you know? They're trapped in a bit of a cycle where they start uh, fixating on profits, there's a backlash, eventually someone takes the helm and steers the ship away from the iceberg, uh, and then they are safe for a while, everyone is happy, things are getting better, and then, you know, complacency sets in and then they kind of get trapped in this... Y you see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I 100% agree. This is, this is pretty much the cycle of Games Workshop. They've gone through it a few times and it requires people to really warn them, right? Like they have to, they, they have to end up feeling the effects of these. And often it sort of, it, it also coincides with sort of overstepping litigation mm -hmm. on Games Workshop's side as well. And I think that we're beginning to get into one of those, uh, we're, we're heading towards an iceberg right now, I think. Um, so we'll see whether or not they can steer away again. Yeah, I, I genuinely feel that if ninth edition keeps going in the way that it is, I, I do feel like uh, there is going to be a major uh, a backlash. Probably not enough to destroy them, but definitely enough to ruffle some feathers. And um, you know, if tenth edition comes out and tenth edition doesn't fix some of these problems, uh, that is that is going to be very bad for them. I don't know, you know, to whether or not they're really going to be all that affected maybe in the long run. It's hard to say, really, uh, you know, if they're going to be here uh, in the next 10 years. I probably think so. I probably think you can bet on that. But I guess it's important to remember and to have some kind of perspective where, like, this is a game. It's a war game. It's, it is not the end of the world if we kind of step back a little bit from it. Um, we do want it to be better. I want it to be better because I want you know everyone to play games. But um, sometimes I think maybe we can just you know put it into perspective a little bit. Yeah, certainly. I mean, a hundred percent. On the other hand, though, what I will say is that the, these war games do take up people's a yeah. lot of people's time, a lot of people's time and effort. I mean, uh, from buying the miniature to then building the miniature to painting it to then playing with it. Um, it's not quite like a video game. Um, I think you can really kind of, well, I suppose lots of people dedicate their lives to video games, but you can, you can really pretty much spend a lot of time on these hobbies and they result in, you know, in, in art and they, they result in very, you know, very tangible items that you can place on your shelf and you can then utilize. And I think that as, as we spoke at the very beginning, that they're very social things as well. So it's understandable that people feel very emotive. You know, there's there, there's a lot of emotions that go into mm -hmm. into the into the hobby and into this space. So people are always going to be passionate about these elements, and I think that that's a that's a good thing. I yeah. think um, because the hobby is so small right now. I think it's it's getting bigger, and that's great. It's getting more accessible, and it's getting more diverse, and this is all great. Mm -hmm. um, but it is still small, yeah. as you say. Yeah, uh, you know, I I don't want us to be necessarily all doom and gloom because i do think that things can change at games workshop um i do think that uh you know uh part of it is probably building up more of a united front between the gamers and the people on the inside and having much more of a dialogue but also on the other hand i agree with you uh for the most part there are plenty of people whose livelihoods are now tied to games workshop for better or worse you know people who do uh model reviews painting uh, battle report channels, you know, there are plenty of battle report channels that probably couldn't play another game to, if they want to get views, you know? Yeah, they'd have to be like, um, uh, guerrilla miniature games. I don't know if you've ever watched that channel, but, uh, Ash Barker, uh, who runs that channel, he plays a different game every single day. So he has a, he has a Wednesday, I think it is for games workshop games. And then every other day he plays a different game. But he has a battle report out every single day, and it's the only way that you could run a channel on a variety of different game systems. Mm -hmm. Whereas people who focus exclusively on, you know, Warhammer games, they can get away with, you know, releasing one a week. Yeah. So that's the, you know, that's the sort of trade-off. And it's the same for, I mean, I suppose anyone in the content creator space will tell you that the moment that you talk about someone other than Games Workshop, you're you're not going to get the same traction you yeah. know from from the community because so many people are just interested in games workshop products yeah that's something that i'm hoping in the future to sort of try and change i'm hoping to try and spotlight some smaller games some different games games that people might be interested in that all are, are sort of positioned as alternatives to games workshop products um and i'm hoping to do so in a way that does appeal to warhammer players mm -hmm. so specifically designed around the idea that people who are just super interested in warhammer might get something out of this content so fingers crossed that that goes well i'm hopeful that that it will though because i think that it's super important 
Um, and I think that there is in the future. Um, I do think that we are on the cusp of a golden age for miniature wargaming. Maybe yeah. not necessarily for Games Workshop, but for miniature wargaming. I do think we're seeing the rise of indie games. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing the rise of uh, miniature agnostic games yeah. where you can play any miniatures that you want. And like you said, that might begin to sort of create an ecosystem very similar to the historical space where fantasy and sci-fi, you'll be able to play with different games. You know, yeah, with, with yeah you'll, you'll have a company that sells minis, but then you can also buy minis for the same rule set from another company and you can yeah. all mix and match and do what suits you. Because that's ultimately where the consumers gets the most value, where they can mix and match or choose which minis they want to get for the which rules they want to play inside of a broader sort of historic uh, setting, you know, I can play 30 different types of uh, American Civil War, you know, war games, and I can get so many different miniatures for those war games at different scales. And I feel like that's kind of what we should be developing, really, uh, outside of Games Workshop. Um, but yeah, we're uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, I just wanted to end onto the point about indie games. Uh, I was inspired by some of the stuff of, of Warhammer to work on some games of my own. I have uh, a game uh, called Techno Barbarians, which is about uh, warlords of a, a post-apocalyptic earth that is inspired by, of course, the reunification war. Because I thought that, that that would be a super interesting setting for a game. And there isn't any war games like that. <laughs> so, you know, if you want a game where you can have like a war elephant with a laser cannon, uh, that is that is something that I'm working on. Uh, and I have another one uh, called The Shadows of Terra, which is much more about like sort of internecine noble conflict. Because I also find that to be very interesting. There are lots of parts of Warhammer because it's so big, you can have any kind of thing really in it. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, please go ahead and shout out your channel. Uh, sure. So my channel is Discourse Miniatures. It'll be linked um, I... in the, the description. Awesome. And I, you can check that out. Everything I do is there. You'll find critiques of Games Workshop in terms of their practices and also just general hobby content as well. Yeah. You'll find lots there. And pretty funny skits. Uh, that, is, that is pretty funny. <laughs> Thank skits. you. <laughs> All right, uh, so this has been Bite Marks. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, you can check out our socials. They're linked in the description. We recently got access to the community tab, so we're going to be posting a lot on that. Uh, so follow us for more memes. Um, yeah, we just, uh, you know, subscribe to the channel. Uh, you know, check out our Patreon if you have some spare money. Uh, be well and uh, take care. Good night, everyone.